Well, thank you for coming today. Uh, we already had one great talk, so I'll try to get you through this as, I mean, to be as painless as possible. Um, hopefully it's not very boring. Uh, I'm Marius Michaelidis, and I work uh, as research data scientist at uh, H2O. Today I'll talk about uh, StackNet. Without hesitating, has StackNet is a, a tool I have developed for my research. So uh, I'm a part-time PhD at UCL. And um, my supervisors are Professor Trolliven and Giles, who's also here, sits so right there. They have helped me a lot. And um, so basically, StackNet, is a meta-modeling methodology. I'll just tell you what it is, and then we'll go through each one of the stages. But meta-modeling in this context means that we use models as inputs to another model. So we have a, a, a dual modeling, modeling process, or even more than two, that uses stack generalization Often this is also called stacking. Uh, this is something, uh, it, it is a methodology to combine different models. And uh, it falls into ensemble techniques. This is something we heavily use in Kaggle. And it really helps to make very predictive models. And I will explain this process later on. Stacking is also based in neural networks. Um, I think there are various elements of neural networks that uh, I think Stacknet really um, can leverage, I mean, in terms of the idea and the architecture. And yes, why not? Leverage the hype, too. And um, you can imagine it as a neural network where each node is not a typical perceptron, as you have normally in neural networks, like a, a simple linear regressor, but any machine learning model you want. So it is a neural network of machine learning models where it's not going to be any machine learning model. Um, and the first version was built in Java. Uh, what I need to say here is that StackNet is both the methodology and the tool. So you, you have both in one. I mean, you can use the methodology, which I will explain. Uh, and also, you know, you can use the tool. So. Uh, why bother knowing about uh, about StackNet? Uh, it definitely helps you to improve predictions. Uh, generally, stacking does. Uh, I think this has been something that uh, top people in Kaggle have been doing it for a while. Uh, you know, it helps you to give you this this extra mile uh, when when things become competitive. This extra decimal points. So I think knowing more about StackNet can really give you this this boost. And sometimes maybe small, but. There have been situations which actually has been quite great. I think it is educational in its own way just because it provides the framework and the playground to actually try different things here. Like how many models can I combine? How many made, you know, uh, layers should I put? Um, what, what kind of algorithms should I put in each layer? What, what works in, in, in each problem? So I think it provides exactly this playground for you to try, to try different things. And uh, I think I have put quite some work to, to compile lots of uh, machine learning algorithms and methods in order to make certain that they're together in a unified space where you can, you can, you know, you can draw from this pool and create uh, you know, powerful ensembles out of it. Uh, I have, not just myself, or, I mean with my teammates, but we have won the two Kaggle competitions using it as, as the core, as the main uh, the main methodology uh, behind it. Uh, it has several top 10 uh, use cases, and uh, it has helped me get number one in Kaggle at some point uh, last year. Uh, I should say that StackNet, apart from my PhD, it was born and bred on the predictive modeling battlefield, so baptized into, into the crucibles of competition. So uh, it, 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 it's been built to scale and, and be quite competitive. So before, when I mentioned the inspiration about StackNet, I mentioned uh, meta-modeling. So here I will try to use a very naive example, just because I'm not sure how edu 
educated, everyone is on the subject. Uh, just to give you an idea why metamodeling works, at least theoretically. Uh, it, it's not 100% accurate, but it should give an idea, I think, about uh, how it works. So let's assume we have three students here. Uh, LR, SVM, KNN, they argue about the physics question. You know, each one gives different answer. LR is uh, 13, SVM 18, KNN 11. They cannot work it out. Everybody has, like, you know, their own arguments. I mean, uh, and they decide to take an average. Let's say, let's take an average. We cannot work it out. 14, 14 is the answer. So this was a, a simple way of assembling. So you have three different models here, three different uh, students. Uh, everyone has, has their own opinion. Uh, they have their own knowledge. And uh, you know, they give an answer. You find a way to combine this. But what if you had someone else to make this decision that actually knows the students well, knows their strengths and weaknesses, uh, uh, and knows how they think? or how well they know physics, maybe, even without knowing the input data, even without knowing what is the question. So let's say there is a teacher, Ms. DL. Ms. DL has heard the argument. She hasn't heard, actually, what's, what was the, uh, the, the exact question, but she knows the student very well. She knows that SVM is a, really, is a, is a master class student. Her father works in the, I don't know, uh, University of Excellence for Physics. Uh, he's, the, he's, the, he's the leader there. And uh, she believes that uh, she wouldn't give uh, an answer that would be like too far from the truth. So she's very keen to give much higher weight to her. So she knows the strengths and weaknesses of each one of the, of the people, of the, of the models. And uh, even she might be biased. You know, sometimes machine learning models, in a way, you know, they, they, they would prefer some type of, of features or input data over others. So she would pick this, uh, she would give an answer of 17 that is hopefully better than the simple average. I think the whole story can be more complicated if we involve more people. We can say that there is another teacher, let's call him RF, who has been secretly giving lessons to LR about physics. He's also a physics teacher himself. And he thinks Ms. Dial, who is a mathematician, underestimates LR. And he actually believes that LR should have a higher weight and he will be keen to say that the answer is actually 16. So this is how we, we start converging to different, to different answers. With, and, and we have estimates without actually knowing the input data. The only thing we know is the models. We know the students. We know their ability to pick right, right and wrong and how often they do it and based on what data. Um, so we have a dispute which can be resolved with a a more powerful authority or, or a higher level model. And this is how we create a level two metamodeling uh, ensemble, where the, the GBM, who is the headmaster in this scenario, will have to pick the right answer without knowing what the students have said, without knowing what, what the, even the question was, just knowing uh, the, the, teacher, the teachers, basically. And He's more keen, let's say, to trust his, his physics teacher. So this is a naive scenario. But in reality, this is how metamodeling works in a way. So we have some input data. We have models that look at this input data on higher levels. And maybe they make some clumsy predictions. And then you have some higher level models that are trained on uh, historical information of how the lower level models have done in order to be able to help them to get to, to more reasonable answers. I think, I think this sums up in a way, in a very simple and graphical way, the metamodeling process. And you, you could see why it could be, could be useful. Why, I mean, no model is perfect. They, they still make mistakes. And this is why metamodeling is there. And you can presume that the bigger you make this, the more difficult it will be to get more juice out of the, of, the, of the smaller layers, as every layer is more sophisticated. Hopefully, I didn't spend too much time on this. I was afraid about this slide. <laughs> OK, moving on. Uh, so the second inspiration is, is uh, stacking. 
Now, stacking was introduced in 1992, and I think it has been quite successful as an ensemble methodology. It, it consists of various steps. Uh, initially, you have a data set, and you split it to two, or you have two data sets, whichever you want to call it. Then you pick one of the two data sets, and you train several models, and you make predictions to the other data set. And then you take all these predictions to the other data set, and you use the label of that data set to remodel, basically. This is, this is what staging is. And if I just, uh, to illustrate you, to illustrate this, imagine we have three different data sets here. So we have data set A, B, and C. Each one has a set of, of uh, features, x0, x1, x2, xn, and then a target variable. For two data sets, we know the answer. For the third one, we don't. We try to, to actually predict this. So what we will do is we will pick an algorithm, and then we will train a model with A and make predictions from B and C at the same time and save these predictions. So I'm started creating a new, two new data sets here. So the predictions of A for B, I call them B1, and the predictions of A to C, I call them C1. Then I pick another algorithm and I do the same. Again, I fit on, on A and I make predictions for B and C and I stack the, the prediction next to the other. So you see a new data set, is two, two data sets are slowly formed here. And uh, this is where also the stacking comes as a term. You see how I append each column next to the other. And I can do this with another algorithm again. So what happened is I have two new data sets here, the predictions of A on B and C through various algorithms. And I have the same label here. So now I can fit on these predictions and apply them on C1 to get uh, my final prediction. So this, this actually works quite well in, in practice to get uh, very strong predictions. I mean, we use that heavily in, in, in Kaggle. And uh, there are hundreds of papers that are actually using it. And they, and they claim it. it. It yields uplift. So. The next thing is, is neural networks. I think uh, Darren made a, an interesting point before. I was about to make exactly the same point. Uh, they came up around 1958, I think. There is some dispute, dispute about it, maybe, when was the first time. But uh, with the perceptron, when they were trying, which is a very simple model, really, looks like a regression, uh, when they were trying to mimic the human brain. And then they came back and forth a couple of times without managing to, to, to really survive. Uh, I think that was because um, they have problem in training. It was very difficult to scale. At some points, it was even difficult to convert. They came up with back propagation. Then they resurfaced. They call it the events of the perceptron, I think, back then. Uh, but the, the, I think problems in with speed and with overfitting, underfitting, made it very difficult for them to, to, to survive versus, at least, versus other, other tools. So then, I think uh, in the last few years with the advent of GPUs that has allowed to, uh, neural networks to scale at, at, at crazy speeds that can be like 100 times faster than in CPU or even more. And, uh, and there's so much development about all these hyperparameters that control different problems that uh, are made, uh, were making neural networks uh, difficult to convert, like dropouts, regularizations, uh, normalizations, batch normalizations, uh, and, and, you know, and, and so many other things. So now they have resurfaced. They have resurfaced, and they have done so in a strong way. And uh, it is considered the state. This, this architecture is considered state of the art for many problems. And this notion of including hidden layers that are, in a way, features that represent the input data, uh, I think it worked quite well with, uh, with the StackNet idea. So I, I thought it, it would be, uh, this is exactly the notion of StackNet, of how different features are, are, are uh, describe the, the, previous, the previous layers. And then I made this tool in Java. Again, the reason I chose Java is because I, I basically wanted to extend it. I mean, there is already a good framework for Python and R. I always liked Java. I started with Java. And I felt that 
maybe more people can be impacted with, with Java. I knew that it, it, it's not, in terms of usability, probably it's not the greatest choice, but it's, uh, you know, there, there are so many people that, that uh, work with Java. Java is, uh, uh, it might be actually the most popular language. It is, uh, it's, it's almost in any operational system in so many billion devices. Almost every computer has it. So I, I, saw, I saw potential. I saw potential to extend the reach of data science, and that's why I decided this. And at the same time, it is, it is, it is a decent language. I mean, it's not. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very good for, for development. H2 is also based in Java, and it's super efficient. Uh, also, I think I tried my best to create an API that is similar to Scikit, which is, again, not uh, it doesn't exist for uh, uh, for Java. But I may not have done a great job. I don't know, but uh, this is what I tried to do. So when it started, you know, in order to be able to 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 create different architectures, I think you need to have uh, available algorithms. It started with some basic implementations which I've built from scratch, and they, uh, you know, based on papers. But uh, I have to admit that. Uh, it, it, many of them are not as good as other implementations. So what I quickly did is include the second batch where I have actually brought all these uh, you know, great tools, H2O, XJBoost. So all these algorithms or some algorithms of these are, are now available and empower it. So you can make quite, quite crazy ensembles with it. Uh, I'll skip this slide. So how training works here, I mean, uh, I explained to you before that the way stacking works is you need to have a data set to make predictions for. So you need to have two data sets. Imagine that uh, if I wanted to build something very deep, I would have to keep resplitting my data constantly in order to create an unbiased validation data set. So in order to avoid doing this, I use, uh, I call it a reusable holdout. So what I do is I have, I only use one data set basically, a training data set. Let's say I split it in five parts. Five is a hyperparameter, I call it K. And then let's say I use these four parts, I form, I form a data set, and I predict the first part. Then I use the other three part, the other four parts, and I predict the other, the other part which I left uh, aside. And slowly, I reconstruct my, my training data. So I, I, I score it in budgets, in, 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 in validation format. And this is how I generate one, one prediction that has the same size as the initial training data. So by reshuffling, by, by rotating, essentially, the, the, the training data. This is, this is quite standard. Uh, and I have two basic training modes. Uh, as you can understand, StackNet is not trained through backpropagation. Every model is trained immediately, mapping at, at the target variable. And uh, you don't have this notion of, of epochs, you know, of different iterations. You have one chance to get the weights right. So what? Uh, so apart from the normal relationship which exists in standard neural networks. You also have the ability in each layer to, to predict based on all previous layer. Now, if you can imagine the naive example I gave in the beginning, the, the headmaster could use the teacher's predictions, but also the kids' predictions at the same time in order to make a better decision. Uh, that way, you have this ability to, to reuse the data from previous layers uh, and Try to see if you made a mistake. I mean, you have a chance to, to revisit it. That's, that's, that's the notion behind the, the restacking mode. That was about the, the theory. Now, in terms of the, of the command line parameters, like how you actually use the tool. The tool is in GitHub. You download it. It comes as a, as a jar file. Jar is, is, is a file specific to Java. Uh, and the only thing you need is actually this file, along with the folder I call lib. This is the only thing two things you need. You don't need any other special installation. Only, only these two things. Uh, and then you obviously need to bring the data in the right format, which I'll tell you about in a while. But you have several parameters in, in a command line tool that you try to, to, call, uh, to call stacknet. Um, 
Uh, one is if you want to have sparse or no data. If people are not familiar, I will explain later. Some uh, are not really that important. If, if, if the file has headers, uh, if I want to export the model in order to do scoring at the later stage, I can give a name for it. Uh, I can name a prediction file to save my results. I specify a training and a test file. The training file needs to have the target variable in the beginning. Uh, test target is just whether the test data set also has a label. This is for when we really want to validate, so to check the metric on a, on, on a validation data set, basically. Uh, but I think the most important thing is really the parameters. So the parameters is a file that uh, is, is a basically a TXT file that says which algorithms to use. And you use a, a break line, so a white, a white space, uh, in order to define a layer. So in this scenario, you can imagine as this being the three kids we saw before. And this one, the random forest classified, is the first teacher. So if I wanted to keep adding uh, uh, the, a, a GBM, I would leave a space. And I would leave it here if I wanted another layer. Or I could add more, more teachers here. Sorry, I still use this example, but I think it's easier to, uh, to, to relate. Uh, and as you see, apart from the from the the name, then it comes with a set of, of hyperparameters, like for example, logistic regression, what is the the regularization, or how many threads to use, uh, gradient boosting, how many trees to use. Uh, all these are specified in the uh, in, in in the GitHub. And uh, a typical a typical command will look like that. So first we call the jar file. We say if we want regression or, or classification. We say if we have sparse data, let's say yes or false. Um, I, I, I generally prefer sparse data. The, I think StackNet, I still, at least the algorithms I've built myself, they're more optimized with, uh, with sparse data. Um, now then the file you want to export the model. Uh, what's the prediction? Where, where you want to save your, your predictions? In pred.csv. That's my training file. That's my test file. The parameters reside in a file called params.txt. Uh, please print stuff about the progress of StackNet in, along the way. Run on three threads. That means build three models at a time. Uh, so the more cores you have, the faster it will be. You have two ways to apply scalability. I forgot to mention this. One is how many models are built in parallel, but also each algorithm also accept threads internally. For example, a random forest threads means how many trees to build in parallel. And uh, yeah, the metric we monitor could be log loss, AUC, or RMSC, or MAE in, in, in regression. And the, the data file, the training data file structure is actually quite standard. It uses the, the SVM light format. Where you have the target variable in the in the beginning, which would be one zero, and then you have the the input features. So the nice thing about this format is you just specify the column and the value, and whichever is not mentioned means it's the zero. So here you say column thirty two is one, which means that all the columns between zero and thirty two are zero. And you don't need to mention this. So it saves memory. It, it's very practical. This is how also in Kaggle we, we, we try to work with this type of uh, files. You know, we try to, 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 to compress memory in order to make our operations much, much quicker, especially some competitions with 50 million rows and million features, but very sparse, like in text classifications. This, this is a must, this, this, re this representation. Uh, and now I'm going to use, uh, explain to you briefly uh, an example where I also have on, on GitHub, uh, where you can use it to get top 10 in a popular Kaggle competition. So you just run it and you get, you get uh, top 10 using uh, StackNet. And only the initial algorithms. So this is without all the new additions you, you, you've seen. Um, I think what's... Uh, What's really nice about this competition is, is the first I participated. And back then, it had 1,700 people. It, it was quite popular for, for, for when I entered. 
And uh, what I really like about this competition is that it basically had, uh, I think, only nine columns. Yeah. So it, you might think that there is no much to do with only nine columns. But if you enter Kaggle, and this is what I thought too, but if you enter Kaggle at this period, you would understand that actually you need hours, for, uh, if not days, to get the most out of these eight columns. Uh, 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 it's just, you know, t t t I think an interesting point is when I first entered there, I spent three weeks to get top 10%. And, and I built my stack net now in, in uh, maybe in a day that scored top 10. Uh, I, I just, you know, t to give you the idea of uh, uh, the, the knowledge, obviously, I've acquired, but also, you know, no knowing the tricks really helps, you know, knowing how to stack models, know, now knowing how to, to pre-process the data can really yield uh, uh, advantage. Um, I, I don't want to go in much in detail into the data pre-processing uh, I've done. It is on the GitHub, but uh, it's, it is really important, but it's not in my scope. My scope is to show you how I use StackNet to learn, and, and what I got out of StackNet, not what I got out of feature engineering. So. Only basically eight columns, all categorical, very high cardinality. So each one had thousands of categories. So you had 60, uh, maybe you had uh, 33,000 rows of training data. Each column might have 10,000 unique values. And, uh, and it, it was, you had to find a way to use them without overfitting. And you could get into extremely high uh, accuracy for predicting whether an employee will require special access. So you can imagine these features were what type of role this employee had, who was his manager, will he require special access, like administrative rights, for example. It, it seems that Amazon was interested to, to, uh, to either to control risk or I mean, to only give it to people that are sensible to have access to, only if the model says so. Um, and at the same time, you know, save some some cost in dealing with these requests. And uh, the metric to optimize was AUC, which is very sim very very common in Kaggle, is about discriminate how good the discrimination of your score is versus your target variable. You can find the links here, and all the tutorial that I have put in places where you use StackNet to get the top ten here. Uh, and this is the score that shows you can actually get the top 10. So I'm not lying to you. So my parameters file, actually, I made two models for this. I will only show you one, just because I think the second one was a bit more complicated. But it, it, even, even this one was able to get top 10%. Um, it, it, had, it lists nine models, each one with different uh, parameters. The input data was all in one hot encoding. So you would expect that linear models would actually do better in this transformation. And then I have only one, one meta model. I think what, what's interesting, I mean, the way I thought of this structure, uh, and generally the way I try to think in order to make a strong ensemble is, I know I need to include many models. I cannot include only one and two. If you have only one and two to play with, you don't have much to go with. I mean, you need to have different options, allow allow the model to, to, to learn from, from uh, uh, to leverage the difference of, of, of the models in their ability to seize the data. And uh, the second thing I also mentioned is diverse model. You don't want to have models that do the same thing. Sometimes it's better to have a crappy model that tries to, to seize the data a little bit differently because it's more likely to yield new information. And the, I always the way I try to think, having this in mind, is I need to have at least one model from, from let's say, an abstract family. Uh, I, I use this, this terminology myself, so it might not be correct. But I have in my mind that these rough families are linear models, like logistic regression, linear regression, uh, random forest models, which could be decision trees, or tree-based model, decision trees, extra trees, random forests. Could be GBMs like XGBoost or, or this light GBM. Uh, factorizations like LibFM, 
support vector machines and then obviously neural networks. There are more categories like KNNs, but in this scenario, I um, or Bayesian, for example, I, I use all these categories. Again, my idea is the more you put, the better it is. You just need to make certain that you don't just put them. You do actually some work to find some good parameters. Uh, having said that, normally the more you put, the better it is. At some point it converges, but it's really tough to lose from this. It's tough to lose because you overdid it. Because the meta modeling, the meta mod, the, the second layer model will, will account for this. We'll, we'll find out that you know half of the model you gave me are not good, so I'm not, I'm not going to use them. They don't give me anything. Um, yeah, I've mentioned this. So the results in, of this model basically look like that. So each model gave quite, quite diverse results. The higher it is, the better. Now, the interesting thing is if you try to take a, an average of this, it will give you a score worse than the, the best model, which was this one. It has an AUC of 0, uh, 0893, which is where actually stacking can, can get uh, the most out of it. Stacking can go on and say, I know this model is not good. I can see it. I'm not going to use it much. Or I will only use it where I think it's, um, you know, I think it can add value. Uh, and I will focus, I will try to capitalize on what is stronger. It, it can see this through, through the training data. So just adding one meta modeler was able to improve AUC just on the same input data without changing anything, just building these models. I didn't even spend that much time to find good hyperparameters. I was able to get this, this gain, which in this competition is around the uh, top 10%. And this is how I see StackNet. You put a data set, and instead of getting one score from one model, you get an improved one. Sometimes this improvement could be really high, sometimes could be very low. Uh, in Kaggle terms, it, it is almost always significant. Because, you know, especially in Kaggle, you try to chase those, those little decimal points that uh, uh, make the difference. Now, from a business point of view, it's not a skyrocket difference, I guess. Uh, that maybe would, uh, would prove that you really need to add this, or maybe not. Uh, depends on the situation. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think from a research point of view, I think it, it always adds value. Like, uh, unless, I mean, there are certain situations that might not work, which I will try to cover. Uh, but I think s something that people tend to ask me is how to find good parameters. And I have dedicated two slides to this. The way I work is normally I, I create my parameters file and I put only two models. So I put one, a student model, a base model, and one meta model. The meta model is a crappy one. It doesn't matter what it is. It just needs to be something that finishes quickly. Because my intention is just to find the, the best parameters of this model. I don't care about this one. So as I run one model, I see the cross-validation results, and I, know, you know, I keep a note of them. And I terminate the process before actually it reaches the, the, the meta modeling stage. This is just to see. Uh, how well these parameters do. And just because StackNet expects at least, at least two layers, so that's why you need to put this. So what I do is I try some parameters, and then StackNet starts printing the results of its, of its fault. For example, I can see AUC in my first fault, 0783, second fault, 0782. I say that's OK. Now, what happens if I increase max depth from 5 to 6? I repeat the same process. I, I, start, I start again the training, this, the same command. And I can see that now the results are improved. So I, I, I keep note of the average. 